thank you guys for for joining me today. And we already got started a little bit, so uh, we'll just we'll get right back into it. Um, as you know, this is the 2022 midterm election, and you know, I'm a lot of times people they don't pay attention to these elections, um, which is crazy to me because. I think they're just as important as a presidential election year. And so we'll start by talking a little bit about that. You all are here, so you probably know this because you're, you're educated people. But, um, you know, a midterm election is, of course, the election that happens in between presidential election years. And like I just got done saying, a lot of times people, they think only the presidency matters. But in our system of checks and balances, you know, power is shared between a Congress, the legislative branch and the judicial branch. And so it's important to not just vote in that presidential election because these other co-equal branches of government uh, have considerable power in determining what the direction of our country looks like. And so in this particular midterm election, you know, you've got right now uh, control of Congress. Both houses uh, is in the hands of the Democrats with very slim majorities. Uh, there's a 50 50 split in the Senate. According to our Constitution, the vice president breaks the tie in the Senate as president of the Senate. So Democrats have a narrow majority there. And then in the House, you can see uh, Democrats have 220 seats to the Republicans, 212. And then three seats are vacant right now. That's what those three gray dots represent. So essentially, in order for Republicans to take back the House, they would need to have a, a five seat uh, swing there. Or actually, yeah, five suites, uh, five seat swing uh, in order to do that. Um, and and why, why is Congress so important? Number one, Congress appropriates tax dollars, the budget. They set the budget. And, and, you know, as many politicians have said, when you're talking about priorities, don't just talk about priorities. See what the budget says, because that's what your priority is when, when you're spending money and how you're spending it. Um, the Senate specifically has the huge responsibility of confirming uh, president's judicial appointments. That is a huge deal right there. You know, when I'm teaching government to my students, I remind them of the fact that that's a legacy item for whomever is president of the United States, because judges in our federal system serve life terms. And, you know, presidents are looking for people whose philosophy and ideology is similar to theirs. who are going to be on the bench to interpret our Constitution in a way that is in conformity with with how they view the role of government. So it's a huge responsibility. It's a huge power. And yes, the president appoints, but the Senate confirms and the Senate can block uh, judicial appointments. And so that's a major deal. Um, so, yeah, Congress, power of the budget is huge. Power to confirm uh, presidential appointments is also huge. And that's why this particular midterm election is especially important, depending on you know individuals views on on different issues and politicians. Um, and by the way, as we're going through this, if you have any questions, you know, please feel free to, to stop me and, and, and we can talk about that. Um, like we did advertise, you know, this is, of course, nonpartisan. So I'm not, and I, I always tell my students this, too, uh, and I still tell them this. At first, they think I'm being rude when I say this, but I say, I don't care what anybody thinks. And then I, I pause for a second and I said, I care that you think, um, you know, I don't, I don't care what anyone's individual views are. I just want people to participate in their community and in voting and in the election process. Um, but OK, so it's not just about half what happens in Washington, D.C., though. There's this, you know, misconception that only the important stuff happens in our federal government and in D.C. But that's not the way our system set up. You know, we have a system called federalism, which is the sharing of power between the national government and the state governments. And the Constitution, it's specifically mentioned that, you know, per the Tenth Amendment, essentially any any power or area of policy that's not mentioned in the U.S. Constitution is a responsibility of the states or to the people. So as we talked about before this officially got started, the Constitution's only four pages. So obviously there are a ton of areas of policy and, and responsibility that then are not covered in that document, which then means, according to the Tenth Amendment, it's the responsibility of the state government to have, you know, authority or jurisdiction over those things. And so it's really important that we think about our state elected officials and not just, you know, the governor and the lieutenant governor and those, but our state representatives and our state senators, because it's at that level that they have the responsibility of making decisions that impact our daily lives. Um, I, I had, you know, the, a good opportunity several years ago to work in the state Senate for three years for a senator. And when I had that opportunity, I saw up close and, and, and personally just how much stuff that we were doing impacted my friends and family and the people that I live with right here in Popper Bluff and all, all across the state of Missouri in different communities. And so I'm going to show you some resources to here in a little bit for how you can actually kind of keep tabs on our state representatives and, and our state senator and, and those different officials, because unfortunately, those are individuals that don't get a lot of media attention. 
Uh, when we're looking at what's covered in the media, it's typically national politics. And like I just got done saying, we have a system of federalism. Power is shared between the states and the national government. And, and states are sometimes more important than what is happening in Washington, D.C. But we don't know because it's not discussed. It's not covered as much. And what we're seeing, too, is like, you know, with local newspapers shrinking or going away, uh, that's even less coverage about what's happening in Jefferson City or with our city government or county government and things like that. Um, so it's getting harder to actually understand what's going on. And but I'm going to show you some resources here in just a little bit um, that I think will be helpful. Actually, we'll get to that right now. Um, so the first thing I've got in here in a little bit, um, this is going to be posted online. But if you wanted to take a picture of this, you could. That way you could go to these resources uh, later. Um, what I tried to do is I created URLs to make it shorter so that people wouldn't have to type, you know, a lot of things in. Um, so it makes it a little bit easier. But we're going to go through all of these things today and talk about them. Um, and then, of course, I'll be happy to stay back afterwards and, and help you access any of them or, or review any of them. Um, so let's start with looking at our specific ballot. OK, so, Lord, what's the address here? Do you remember? So you would type your address in. Hopefully it'll pop up. Oh, yeah, because this is not a residential place. OK, um, I'm trying to think. I'll type in the high school's address, see if that comes up. There we go. OK, so once you would type in your address, you would click this view candidates and issues. And then the ballot pops up there. So um, Missouri, with with our election system, our most of our statewide constitutional offices are on the same cycle as a presidential election year. So the only statewide office besides U.S. Senator, which we'll talk about here in a second, is the state auditor. Um, oh, here we go. The other five, so governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, treasurer, and attorney general are on a cycle as a presidential election year. So we're only voting on the auditor uh, in this cycle. Uh, for U.S. senator, of course, as you probably know, each state has two. Uh, senators serve a six-year term. So there is always a, a period where Missouri doesn't have a U.S. Senate election. That's not the case now, though. We do have retiring Senator Roy Blunt. His seat is open. He did not choose to seek re-election. And so you've got... Um, a Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, and constitutional candidate that are on the ballot. And I'm going to show you here in a little bit how to access information about these candidates specifically and, and their views and things like that. Um, the auditor's office there, um, U.S. representative. So each state has at least one U.S. representative. A state gets a number of U.S. representatives matching its total percentage of population compared to the nation. So California has 53 U.S. representatives because from a population standpoint, it's larger. We have eight. So if like you did the math on that, I think that's like Missouri has like 2% of the nation's population or something like that. So that's how many seats of the 435 that we get in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, and then coming on down here to state representative, um, our state senator is not on the ballot because state senators serve four year terms. And Senator Bean was elected to his first term in the 2020 election. So we won't see that office again until 2024. But state representatives, uh, just like U.S. representatives, are on the ballot every two years. So uh, Hardy Billington is the incumbent. As you can see, he has no opponent. Really, when we get to the more local stuff, they're all unopposed. Um, so we have uh, two associate circuit judges, uh, presiding commissioner, um, and a variety of other county offices. Um, one thing I want to go back when we were talking about federalism and we were talking about how in our system, you know, the national government has a set of powers and responsibilities and the states do. One thing that you will not find in the U.S. Constitution is mention of local governments. Uh, local governments don't have this inherent right to exist. They're what's referred to as political subdivisions of the state. So kind of like a street inside of Popper Bluff isn't its own entity. It only exists because the city of Popper Bluff deems it in existence. 
Similarly, Popper Bluff doesn't have a natural right to exist. It exists because the state of Missouri says it exists. Um, so that's what I mean when we talk about a political subdivision. Um, and a lot of the reason I mention that is that, you know, our, our local elected officials, they're very restricted with what they can do because there is a state statute or several state statutes that spell out here are the responsibilities of your office. Here's what you are allowed to do. Here's what you can't do. And so sometimes, you know, and I'm not necessarily, you know, trying to, to make you feel sorry for them, but there are people that get really angry sometimes at our locally elected officials, but they're very restricted with what they can do by state law and the state constitution because, again, their office is part of a subdivision of the state of Missouri. All right. Um, and then at the very end of the ballot, before we get to the ballot questions, um, there are the uh, Supreme Court judges in Missouri and the appellate court judges. And I'm going to show you some resources about them as well. So in Missouri, we have what's called the nonpartisan court plan that selects our Supreme Court judges and our appellate court judges. What that means is that a commission that's comprised of an even number of lawyers and non-lawyers and the chair of that commission is the chief justice of the Missouri Supreme Court. They they have a meeting, so to speak, the seven of them, uh, and they review uh, qualifications of people who are applying to be a Supreme Court judge or an appellate court judge, and they narrow it down to a top three. And then those three go before the governor of Missouri, who chooses one of those individuals. And then that person serves until the next election. And in an election, literally just like now, where, where the voters are asked, yes, the person should be a judge or no, if they, if they get a, a simple majority, yes, they serve for 12 years. And then after that 12 year mark, they're up for a, another retention election is what's that, what's that referred to as. Um, in Missouri, we do a mandatory retirement of our judges at age 70. Um, so, you know, at that point, you know, someone would be ineligible to serve once they hit that age threshold. Uh, but I did want to explain to you how that works. So oftentimes, you know, we were talking about this too at the start. We don't know anything about, you know, Supreme Court judges in Missouri or appellate court judges because, you know, by nature of what a judge does, you know, they're not, you know, politicians. You know, their job is to apply the law, to look at the facts of a situation. And, and so there's not a lot of, of coverage necessarily of them as individuals. And so we don't know a lot about them, especially the judges that are far removed from us. And so there's a really good nonpartisan resources to help understand, you know, their background and, and, and their rulings and different things like that. So we'll, we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. Um, and then at the very end of the ballot are the four uh, constitutional um, or five. Right? Well, four constitutional ballot questions. And then the last one is the constitutional convention question. And, and we'll, we'll go to that one real quickly because that's easy. Um, every 20 years, our Missouri Constitution requires the voters to decide whether or not they want to call a constitutional convention. If a constitutional convention is ordered in an election, which it, it hasn't been, um, then each state Senate district, and there are 34 of them, has to choose two people in an election called for by the governor. And those two people that are elected are the representatives of our Senate district. And they go to a constitutional convention and they have to decide whether or not they want to propose amendments to the state constitution. Those amendments have to get approved by us, though. So ultimately, like we were talking about before we went live here, no matter whatever happens with our state constitution, the voters, us, we have the final decision on all of it. Whether it's coming from the General Assembly in Jeff City as a recommendation, whether it's coming from citizens like us who initiate uh, an idea, or whether it would be through the Constitutional Convention. I think I read that the last time this happened, 35% um, of voters, so that would have been 2002, 35% of voters said, yes, we want a Constitutional Convention. Um, so we'll see what happens now. Um, like we were talking about just a little bit ago, I, if I'm guessing, I think, you know, the sheer volume of our state constitution really scares people off. Um, I mean, it's huge. You know, like we talked about, the U.S. Constitution is four pages. State constitution is thousands of pages. So the idea of opening that thing up, I think, probably scares some people. But we'll see. We'll see what voters decide to do. Let me stop for a second. Do you have any questions for me or any comments about anything I've said so far? What would you What would you change at the constitutional convention? What do, do states do it? Yeah, um, you know, and, and that goes back to our system of federalism. So each state has its own way of doing this, um, if it even allows. You know, I, and I'm not sure, of course, on how every state does it, but, you know, I don't I'm sure there are some states like us that have a re-trigger where every so many years 
voters have to decide if they want to open it up or not. But I mean, once that thing is open at a, at a convention, anything's on the table. I mean, you could you could do like Nebraska, get rid of one of your houses of the legislature and be a unicameral legislature. You could restrict powers of certain political offices. Um, you could wait. You could uh, take you know matter decisions about you know specific policies out of the Constitution that have been previously made. Anything is on the table at that. But essentially, the only rule would be you can't violate the U.S. Constitution, obviously. But outside of that, you can do anything you want at that constitutional convention. And, and, and the delegates at that convention have two choices, um, from my understanding. One, they can have voters uh, vote on each individual suggested change or give voters a wholesale document, take it or leave it. Um, and so that's obviously that would be, you know, a lot larger to bite off, you know, for voters to have to study an entire document as opposed to weighing in on individual changes. So anyway, we'll we'll see. Um, you know, I, I think one of the. If there's anything good that's come of, of um, some of the intensity we've seen lately with politics, it's that more people are paying attention now than ever. Um, and and so who who knows? I mean, there might be more of, of a desire to study the state's constitution. But like I said, it's it's a monster. It is it's a huge huge document. Um, any thank you for that. Any other questions or comments? So I'm going to. Go back to, I'm going to show you this real quick. This is just a, a publishing of the actual ballot measures themselves. Um, so this is what you're going to see, you know, when it says official ballot title in the fair ballot language, this is what you're going to see when you vote on Tuesday, um, unless you've already voted early voting or absentee voting. Um, I also put a link here just to make it a little bit easier. Um, Missouri fair ballot language. This is like one or, yeah, it's actually one page, so it's a little bit easier to read. It just very quickly says, okay, if you vote yes, this is what you're doing. If you vote no, here's what you're doing. Um, so we already talked about the Constitutional Convention. I'm going to kind of work myself my way backwards, actually. Um, constitutional Amendment number five would be to, to take the Missouri Department of the National or make a Missouri Department of National Guard. Um, right now, that falls under the Department of Public Safety. In my research, um, Missouri and the state of Massachusetts are the only two whose National Guards are not their own independent entity. Um, it doesn't appear that there's, you know, an organized effort against this. Um, from, from what I've read, and I'm going to show you so you can see that as well, it looks like the, the impetus or the reason why this is suggested is to create a direct line of communication to the governor um, for, for those for the leader of that agency or that department to be a direct report to the governor as opposed to the director of public safety and then to the governor. Um, the National Guard, you know, is responsible in, in instances of natural disaster going in and helping, you know, clean up. Um, also, civil unrest, you know, going in and, and trying to, to restore order and make sure that, you know, people are kept safe, things like that. So that's what the National Guard does. So anyway, from, from a you know, financial standpoint, uh, it, it looked like, you know, there would be an increase in like one hundred and thirty something thousand dollars needed to make this change. Um, so there, there is that, but it does say here, this will have no impact on taxes. So this measure is not going to raise state sales tax or anything like that. Um, and then going down here to four, this is specifically about the city of Kansas city. Um, so the city of Kansas city right now is the only city whose police force is managed by a state board of police commissioners. Um, <clears throat> well, basically what this stems from, and, and I'll say full disclosure, um, so I, I was a lobbyist most recently before I'm doing what I'm doing now. And the city of Kansas City was one of my clients. So I just want to disclose that. I don't want anyone to think I'm, I'm concealing that. Um, so basically what this boils down to is that you have a philosophical difference between the mayor of Kansas City, um, the, the city government of Kansas City, and the state legislature and the governor in Jefferson City in terms of how police funding should be spent. Um, there are... And again, I'm, I'm, I want to be very careful not to weigh in on either side here. So there's just a philosophical difference on how the money should specifically be spent. What this amendment would do would be to allow the legislature uh, in the future uh, through 2026 to specifically say, here is what percentage of your city budget has to be spent on police funding. That's what this would do. And again, this impacts Kansas City, but because it's a state board, all Missourians get to vote on this matter. 
Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those deals where it kind of goes back to your question about what can you do in a constitution? You can do anything. And, um, this is one of those, those things there, uh, where we do get to vote on that because of, of how it's placed in our, in our system of, of state government. I, I wanted to go back to yeah. five mm-hmm. about the National Guard. So, doesn't the president call it the National Guard? Can, yeah. Mm-hmm. So does this affect them? I wouldn't think so. Okay. No. Um, th- this would just, basically it, it, it's a, seems like it's more of a process change. The, the, you know, adjutant, and I, I don't know what they would, would refer to this individual as anymore, you know, commander or something like that. That, that individual would just report directly to the governor as opposed to the director of public safety. But in cases of, of the National Guard being nationalized, um, no, it, that, you know, that would still function the same. And the governor can call it the National Guard. Uh-huh. Okay. So yep. Two. So like think about Ferguson, what happened in 2014, right? So the National Guard was brought into that or, you know, I, I remember, you know, when there were, what, the tornado in Carothersville, the National Guard was sent in to help clean that up. So instances like that are where the governor does that. Yeah. Um, any other questions before we look at some more stuff? All right. Let's see. We talked about four. We talked about five. Some, someone called me um, a couple of days ago, and oh, they uh, they suggested I mention this, and I didn't even think about it, and so I am going to mention it because you might have this question. They said, tell tell the people who come to this why there's not an amendment to. So whenever ideas get filed with the Secretary of State's office to be put on the ballot, if they if it's filed as an initiative, it has to get so many signatures of voters in order to make the ballot. And so what and I don't even remember now what Amendment 2 was, but whatever it was, it did not get the the requisite number of signatures to meet that sufficiency. So it's that's why it's on the ballot. In Kentucky, I guess this person told me there's an amendment too that's being heavily broadcast on television uh, here. So we're in that media market and it has to do with abortion. And so I, I guess there were some people that got upset with our county clerk thinking that that was being concealed from the ballot or something. And it wasn't because it's a Kentucky issue. This is Missouri, obviously. And again, the reason you don't see an amendment number two is that it did not meet the requirements to get on the ballot. So that's why it goes one, three, four, five. Um, OK. So three, there's a lot packed into this. Um, this is about the legalization of recreational marijuana. So as a reminder, medicinal marijuana is legal now in the state of Missouri. Um, this is about recreation. So, you know, the very first paragraph, um, that's, you know, standard uh, legalese, but basically, you know, people can purchase, possess, consume, use, deliver, manufacture, sell marijuana for personal use for adults over the age of 21. Um, also, anyone who is in prison right now or, or part of a probation and parole arrangement um, that as long as it was not a violent drug offense would be able to petition uh, for removal from those conditions if they had a marijuana related offense that was considered nonviolent. OK, um, and then also there is a six percent tax on on the purchase of that. Um, and we'll and I'll show you here in a little bit. Um, what estimates are for what that would bring into both the state and to to the local governments, because some people have questions about that. And then very simply, a, a no vote would be to keep the status quo in place where medicinal marijuana is permissible at this time. Recreational marijuana is not. OK. Um, any questions about that one? So does it say anything about regu- regulations uh, similar to alcohol? Can't drink and drive. Can you smoke as much marijuana as you want to drive? You know, I haven't I haven't read anything that speaks to that. I would think that laws that pertain to you know driving under the influence of so DUIs um, would apply to this still. Is there any way to measure marijuana in your system? I don't know. I think no. I don't know. That's a good question. I'm not sure. And does it? Uh, Recreational doesn't mean how much you can have on you. Can you pack your transport? So I, and again, and I've not seen that, um, but but I'm glad you brought that up because I want to get into a little bit deeper of a layer that sometimes people don't understand. Um, a lot of times when you pass policy, whether it's the legislature, our state representatives and senators, or us through through this, 
through the initiative or referendum process, um, the the relevant department or agency that has the responsibility to carry out that policy, they have what's called rulemaking authority. And rulemaking authority is, as I tell my students, specifically spelling out, here is how this policy is going to be carried out. And oftentimes, uh, how do I, uh, bureaucrats, these people who are in the agencies, can, can really expound upon what a policy is or, or maybe supposed to be through the rulemaking process. Um, and a lot of times, you know, citizens, they don't understand that because that's something that's not really publicized either. It happens very quietly and it's not, it's nothing that's illegal or unethical, but it just doesn't get media coverage at all. And so, you know, as a former lobbyist, there would be times where we would get legislation passed for our client, but the fight wasn't over there. Just because we got the legislature to pass it and the governor to sign it, then we had to go to the department that had responsibility and make sure they wrote the rules in a way that would follow the spirit of the law that we just got passed. Because otherwise, then it's, it's not good for our client, you know, or in their interest, uh, whatever whatever that was. Um, but fill us here in a second when we pull up some more specific stuff. We'll see what all it speaks to. But from everything I saw, it's, it's pretty vague um, relative to your questions. Mm-hmm. Um, so then lastly, uh, constitutional amendment number one. This is a very wonky and into the weeds amendment. Basically, right now, um, money that is not appropriated by the legislature, the treasurer has the ability to invest that for the state of Missouri to earn interest on that. Uh, to just bring additional revenue into the state of Missouri. The methods or instruments with which the treasurer can invest that money are pretty restrictive and pretty limited. This would expand options that the treasurer has to invest surplus money, basically, uh, to try to earn more interest back for the state of Missouri. It would also allow the legislature um, at different times to specifically authorize the investment into certain type of financial instruments. So that's what that would do. It would allow, um, you know, the, the state treasurer to invest in municipal debt if it has a good rating, meaning that it's it's looked at as, as a good investment or debt, so to speak. Um, so that that's what this specifically does. Um, that's what a yes vote would be. And here in a second, like I said, I'll show you a little bit more commentary on that as well. Um, but any questions about any of these so far? I think were you going to ask a question a second ago. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, you know, a lot of other states will also legalize recreational marijuana. Mm-hmm. On the federal level, it's still considered a controlled substance. Yeah. So as I always told my students when they brought this up, you know, it's in our system, going back to federalism, the sharing of power between the national and the state governments, there's something in our Constitution called the Supremacy Clause, Article 6. And that essentially, in, in layman's terms, is in case of contradiction between the federal government and state governments or the U.S. Constitution and in any type of other legal action, the federal government and the U.S. Constitution takes supremacy. That's what that means. And that was affirmed in a case called McCulloch versus Maryland, you know, long, long time ago in the early 1800s. Um, so in theory, one would think if the federal government via the Controlled Substances Act has said that marijuana is a Schedule One drug, it's strictly prohibited. Why is it why is it legal then? And again, I'm not opining on whether it should or shouldn't be. But just from a legal standpoint, you would think, OK, it's. Article six says federal government trumps state governments, yet over half the states in the country have made it uh, permissible in one form or another. And as I used to tell my students, it's essentially a case of the federal government, you know, closing its eyes and plugging its ears and pretending this doesn't exist for various political reasons that have happened across both Republican and Democrat administrations. Um, You've got, you know, what's called and this gets really complicated, but what's called prosecutorial discretion. Um, and what that refers to is the U.S. Department's of, Department of Justice essentially says we're going to go after marijuana related offenses if they fall in certain categories or criteria. Uh, is the possession of marijuana um, happening while another federal crime is being committed? Is it being possessed on a federal facility? Is it being trafficked to children? Is it being trafficked with weapons? Um, I'm trying to think of some other uh hot button ones there are? Is it being trafficked across state lines, making it a form of interstate commerce illegal? Um, Those are really the instances in which the federal government is choosing to go after people with with marijuana possession. Um, Technically, though, plain reading of the law, every single state that allows it is in violation of federal law, but the federal government is not doing anything about it. So 
So does it say anything about you have to grow it on your own ground? So actually, yeah, there is something about that, getting a permit to be able to personally grow. And, and I'm going to pull that up here in just a second. And then there's also something, and this is what I was talking about when I said that after it gets, if it gets passed, um, where the rulemaking process will come into place, each congressional district, we have eight in Missouri, will have so many licenses for retail dispensaries, basically. And that's not discussed in this constitutional amendment. That will be up to the bureaucrats if this passes to determine what exactly that looks like. Determine who gets a license, um, what are the requirements for applying and then getting a license and maintaining one. None of that stuff is in this. So who gets to be that bureaucrat who makes all of that? That's the I'm, important person. I th it's, in, it's in the Department of um, oh, Health and, and Senior Services in Missouri uh, is, is who is responsible for that. Um, yeah, health and senior services. And I can't remember the exact division. I know the guy, because he used to be a state representative, who is over that subdivision. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. But um, let me go back to this. I mean, I'm, I'm going to we're going to come back to the ballot stuff, but I'm just going to kind of go in order of this. This is something um, that I found when I was doing some research that I thought was really helpful. Uh, the League of Women Voters puts this out. They're a, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. Their primary responsibility is trying to encourage people to register to vote. Um, one of the things that I liked about this is that there have been so many changes across the country and even our state with uh, voter registration requirements and eligibility and things like this. And they do a really good job of just saying, here's what you need to vote. Um, they make it really simple. Um, and so they also spell out, you can see over here on the left, all these different issues about elections, they have a tab for, and you can read through those and see what is the status in Missouri specifically. Because as we talked about before, it's difficult to get resources about our state. And people in other states have this problem too, because the media only ever wants to talk about the national government and not state specific stuff. And guess what? According to the Constitution, election administration is left to the state governments. And that's one. Of, I mean, that's the most fundamental, you know, principle of, of being a citizen. You know, literally the word idiot in Greek, you know, refers to someone who doesn't vote, literally. And so it's so important that we vote and we participate in that process. And I think they have done a really good job of giving voters a lot of information, including, you know, what's on your ballot, even though I've given you another resource to see that. Where do you go vote and then how to register? So one thing I want to go back up to, though, here is the IDs needed for voting. Um, so it has to be a driver's license, uh, a passport, a military ID. It does have to be photo ID. Um, there is a process. That obviously, at this point, it's too late for someone that was seeking to vote. If they don't have one of those IDs, it would be they could vote provisionally, which means that their ballot is held and then it, it's reviewed by by a, a committee, essentially. Um, it is too late for someone to register to vote for this election. And that's another question that students have asked me before. I have a student right now at Three Rivers who is from Ohio. And I believe in Ohio, they have like same day registration as the election. Missouri does not have that. It has to be 30 days out. Um, and that doesn't make Ohio better than Missouri or Missouri better than Ohio. Each state gets to make its own election rules and laws. Um, so anyway, it, it's different every state. But you can look at that. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you. I think there was something else. Oh, this is just something that I encourage people to do in general. I share this with my family members, my students, my friends. You know, when you're on a dot org, we typically assume if it's a, you know, when I was in school and in college and grad school, you know, a dot org is was considered the gold standard. I think it's always important to, to look at the about section of a dot org to make sure that there's nothing hidden in it. Um, to You know, so if you go to about us. You know, it talks specifically um, about what they're doing, nonpartisan information to the public. You know, that's a cue that I'm looking for when I'm trying to give someone unbiased information, the word nonpartisan. Um, you know, you don't want something just because something's not affiliated with the Republican or Democrat Party doesn't mean that it doesn't have a liberal or conservative bias. Um, and so, you know, if, if you're truly looking for down the middle, you know, just facts, you know, you want to look for the word nonpartisan. Um, I think that's important. Um, so anyway, that is a link that is available to you as well. Um, this is something I wanted to share with you just for fun. Uh, I, I also encourage people to do this. It's called isidewith.com. I'm going to, I'm going to walk you through it for a second. So this is to take a quiz to determine 
your political ideology um, and determine which popular candidates right now that you most closely identify with. This is something, you know, I, I told the newspaper reporter who interviewed me the other day, I've, I've been in politics in some form or fashion for over half of my life. I take this thing regularly still and, and surprise myself at how some of my own views shift on things, just living life and learning a little bit more about different things. So I would encourage you to do this. Um, you take, you click take the quiz, and I just want to show you a couple of things about it um, real quick. But another, oh, by the way, that disclaimer box that popped up, it said we're independent, we're nonpartisan. That's a good thing. Um, so there are all these different issues, so environmental issues, uh, science issues, immigration issues, education. It goes on and on and on. This is what I want to tell you if you decide to do this. You, you want to always look here where it says show more questions. If you really want to try to see where you're at, answer all of the questions. It's going to be a more thorough review and analysis of you if you do that. And I will tell you, this will take like 30 to 45 minutes if you do it. And, but it's, it's really good. Here's another thing that I like about it. Let's say sometimes, you know, I don't like, probably like you, when people just ask me a yes or no question about a policy issue, because it's sometimes not that simple. It depends on context and scenario and implication and all that stuff. And so if you click other stances, it gives you other options. There's also this learn more tab right here where you can actually see a little bit more context about what it's asking you about. Um, so anyway, I just think that's a good resource. I always encourage people, um, especially I, I was telling Alora this before we started. Every election, I probably have about 10 votes because people, my friends and family, and, and they're like, how do I vote? And I hate that because. It does, and I, and I've stopped now. I won't tell them. It's like, you need to vote your conscience and your views because they might be, even though we're friends and family, it doesn't mean we view the world the same way. And I always point them to isidewith.com. Go take that quiz and see what your views are. Um, and vote for what's in your best interest, not Mitch Davis's best interest. Um, so anyway, there's that. Um, let's see here. Oh, I was going to, we were talking earlier too about, and then I'm going to come back to Ballotpedia, by the way, because that's, something that I think you're going to really get a lot out of. Um, how to review Missouri judges. And these are the Supreme Court judges and the appellate court judges. Our circuit and associate circuit judges, we elect directly in, in a partisan election. Uh, two of our, our associate judges who are on the ballot right now are running unopposed. Um, so, so there is really technically no election, so to speak. Um, but for these, the Supremes and the appellate court, um, we do have them in a retention election. And remember, a retention election is where we're saying, yes, they get to keep serving or no, they don't. If we vote yes by a simple majority, they serve for 12 years and then they're on the ballot again, assuming they've not met the age out requirement at 70. Um, so if you look at we'll just click Zell Fisher here, uh, who's one of our Missouri Supreme Court judges. Once you click his name, it tells you what he's doing, his background. Uh, there's also a link to his biography or some more information about him on the Supreme Court's website of Missouri. Um, and then what I like is over here, there is survey results. So this, you can click past evaluations when he was on the ballot the last time. What did people say about him? Uh, what did the lawyers who, who can review him professionally say about his performance as a judge? There are also five of his opinions as a judge. And so you could look through those and see how is how is his thinking as a judge? How is he applying the law to situations that have happened in Missouri? Does his rationale and his logic, does that conform with my own as a citizen for how I think judges should rule? But this lawyer survey here, Laura and I were looking at it, and I think it's really helpful. Let me flip it here so we can see it. This tells you specifically from from their perspective as lawyers who have appeared before him, what is his fitness like as a judge? What is his professionalism like? You know, one of these questions, this first answer right here, or first item, writes opinions that adequately explain the basis of the court's decision. So he has an average rating of 4.38, which would mean, you know, he's between <laughs> frequently and every time he writes a decision, the lawyers who appear before him say he is, he is explaining the decision. He's making it clear to us why he's applying the law the way he is. Um, you know, and there's all kinds of, you know, impartiality and fairness. Writes them that address the issue raised by both parties fairly. 4.1. So frequently they're saying that he does that. Um, so, you know, again, I, I want to be clear that lawyers are the people who are writing this. 
So you should keep that perspective in mind when you're looking at this. Obviously, if there are lawyers who um, didn't get the outcome they wanted in a case, perhaps, you know, they're not going to give a judge the best review. But again, this is not a review that's being done by just a lawyer or a couple of lawyers. This is being done by many of their colleagues in the legal community that have appeared before these judges. So um, this is done by the Missouri Bar. The Missouri Bar is the entity that licenses lawyers in the state of Missouri. It's a nonpartisan uh, entity as well. And it's it's responsible for the conduct of, of all lawyers and, and, and judges. Um, well, lawyers, actually. Judges have their own thing. Um, but anyway, so there's that. So I'm just going to go back to that and show you how you get there is you're going to click the link that I showed you here, and then it's going to take you directly here. You're going to click the name of the judge. So if you wanted to look at associate or excuse me, appellate judge Jack Goodman, you would click his name. Again, you're going to get a little biographical information and then scrolling down to survey results. The lawyer survey is what's going to pop up like I just showed you about Judge Fisher. Um, and that's where you can look at how the people who have appeared before him uh, have, have rated him. So it looks like 10, 10 people have 10 lawyers took this survey. Um, yeah. Um, that's a good question. It doesn't look like it. So, and you know, in, in an appellate court situation, you can have all different types of, of legal issues that have come before a judge. So it's not broken down by like, are these coming from, you know, personal injury lawyers or criminal defense lawyers or, um, you know, workers top law, you know, none. so now, I mean, this is just, it's a general thing. Uh oh, uh, and then the other thing I wanted to show you, of course, you know, the Daily American Republic and KWOC, um, I, I have been impressed with their coverage of what's on the ballot. You know, they're not pushing um, an ideological agenda. Um, you know, they're just in, in the, the newspaper, oh, you're fine. newspaper especially, you know, has run several stories about what's including publishing the ballot as they always do. Um Giving, you know, they oftentimes also republish stories from the Associated Press, the AP wire, which are written, you know, in a very kind of mundane way because they're just sticking to here are the facts, things like that. Um, so those are two good sources as well. But the last thing I wanted to show you, which I think is really cool, is Ballotpedia. And this, to me, is one of the most underutilized resources out there. Um, this is a nonpartisan, nonprofit entity that literally is covering as best they can what's happening in every single state government. I mean, it's a major undertaking that they have to bring people access to information. But this first thing that I brought you, I hyperlinked you straight to the Missouri elections 2022. And I'm going to go down and show you some things on that. But before I do that, I want to just show you at the very top where it says search the Encyclopedia of American Politics. You can type anything in about politics. You can type in the filibuster, which is a tool used in the U.S. Senate to, to delay a, a vote or debate on an issue. You could type in... Uh, Joe Biden or Donald Trump, or you could type in literally Hardy Billington, our own state representative. And there's, and I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to use him as an example here in a second, because I think it's good that they go to that level of detail, because how many people don't even know who their state representative is? And that is a person who represents, you know, a little over 30,000 people that are in this area. And, and he has, you know, anyone in that office has this awesome responsibility of being sort of like, are linked to state government and helping with constituent things and, and all kinds of sort of stuff. But anyway, um, if you look down here, it tells you what's on your ballot. Uh, and we've already talked about that. We've got a U.S. Senate election. We've got U.S. House elections. Um, so there are some state Senate races in Missouri, half of the 34 up. Ours is not in that half. Um, all the state house seats are up. Um, oh, one thing I want to point out, too, and again, you know, you you guys probably, you know, you wouldn't be here if you didn't already know what I'm getting ready to say. But, um, you know, Missouri, we have in April, as we know, what's called our municipal election, where city council and um, school board and uh, county health board, if there is a race, those are put on the ballot. Then um, every four years during a presidential election year in March, we have what's called the presidential preference primary. Um, and that determines, you know, where Missouri voters would like who, who we would like to see be the Republican or Democrat or other third party nominee for president. And then August is always the primary election for everything from U.S. senator to governor all the way down to county coroner. 
Um, and then November is the general election period where, you know, that's obviously where you're choosing who the winner of the office is. But if you scroll down this link, it breaks down um, the different amendments. Here's what I like about this. Let's look at the amendment one about the state treasurer with with these securities. Oh, it's not, it's lagging, isn't it? Huh. We need to reset it, maybe. I'm glad Alora's here. <laughs> well, wait till I fix it before. Okay. Okay. Let's just connect. When this happened in my classroom, I'd always just say, "Over and over, technology is my friend." <laughs> 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 Did it work out usually? No. <laughs> no, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't, no. Yeah. <laughs> I had to call for tech support. There we go. Okay, perfect. So what I like about this is that their researchers give you more analysis into what the implication is of passing or not passing these things. So you've got the fair ballot language up top that I showed you before. Um, they, they copied that over from the Secretary of State's website. Um, but then they give you a little bit more information. Like, I love this. How did it even get on the ballot? What's the, what's the reason of the people who wanted this on the ballot? So, and it gives you tons of hyperlinks there to click other things. If you wanted to really dig into this, you have that opportunity. It tells you how the Senate and the House of Missouri voted on it. Um, you've got the text of it. Um, Tells you the ballot title, which you're going to see. Again, the, the fair ballot summary. Um, there's something else I want to show you. Where's it at? Readability score. It tells you the supporters of it. Why are they supportive of it? There's, again, a hyperlink. You can read more about why they're supporting. Um, there hasn't been any, like I told you earlier, any organized opposition to this. Uh, but if there, like the marijuana one, I'm sure there will be. So let's, we'll go back and we'll use that as an example. Um, so if you go back to, or Kansas City, I know there will be an uh, opposition to it. But if we click Amendment 3, I also like this. What's the status of marijuana in Missouri in 2022? So in 2018, you know, that's when it was, you know, legalized for medicinal purposes. So it does a good job of just reminding you. What's the status, to your point, sir, you know, uh, about how this plays out with the whole entire nation? You know, what's the status of it nationally? It breaks that down. Who is behind the campaigns to make it legal? It also will go in. I mean, they, these people are really good about breaking it down. Like, here's the money that's potentially involved in pushing this. Um, and then if we go down to support, here are all the people that are in support of it. Um, there are some of the, the snippets of arguments for why they're in support of it. And then opposition. Um, so it shows you some of our uh, elected leaders who are against it, organizations that are against it, and again, arguments for why they're against it. So I think, you know, this is something that I myself, and like I told you all a little, a little bit ago, I haven't even made up my mind on all of the ballot questions that we have to vote on. I myself this weekend am going to spend some time looking at arguments that people on both sides have, have offered up for why Missouri voters should vote yes or no. And I think Ballotpedia, I'm very thankful for this resource because where else can we go and it all be dumped in one place and it makes it relatively easy uh, to, to see. So there is that. Um, there's something else I was going to show you, too. Um, was there something else? Oh, I was going to look here because I'm just curious about the Kansas City deal. I'm sure that the Kansas City government's opposed to it. I just want to see. Yeah. So, again, you know, it, it gives you arguments for and against why, um, you know, the legislature should be able to increase the amount that they have to spend on, on police funding. Um, yeah, so that, I just threw a lot of information at you. Um and I, I think, you know, again, I, I have vetted these things as someone who, even though I'm not a full time teacher anymore, these are all resources that I would comfortably share with my students to make, you know, informed, educated decisions. Um, these are resources that, you know, do not have a, a political lens to them. They don't have a bias to them. 
its presentation of information for people to decide with uh, what, however they want to vote. Um, but do you have any any other questions for me or any comments or anything like that? I'm going to ask you, there's a 6% tax. Oh, yeah. There. Oh, we were going to look at that. Yeah. Yeah, let me, let's pull that back up. Are there uh, city and county taxes on the box office? Um, states would get a portion of the, or excuse me, the, the municipality will get a portion of the sales tax. Um, I did, I was, I'm glad you said that because I was going to show you that. It's in here. Um, yeah. So local governments are estimated to have annual costs of at least 35,000, annual revenues of at least 13.8 million. So let's see here. Let me click the source on that. Where'd that go? Oh, Laura, I forgot how to get rid of oh. Is this the? Not wanting to leave me alone, is it? I did earlier, I think. I'm trying to pull up. Um, I mean, I'm just going to click out of all this stuff. Okay, so back to this. I want to click this right here. See what their source is. This tech. We're learning together. I want to see how they're weighing that out. Maybe I should just go back here. Because I read it on here as well. So this right here is, is a document that these are people who testified as to why it should or trying to find their analysis for why they think it's going to bring in that much money. That exists somewhere. But also, here's the deal, too. You know, to fill us to some of your questions, what's some of the fine print? Here it is. Um, and, and it's quite, you know, lengthy, as you can see, um, spelling out, you know, exactly how the rules should be written to, to implement this idea. The fair ballot language is fair. It does tell you what it's going to do generally, but all the weeds are a little bit deeper. And, and so where I got there, I clicked in this link here, ballot issues, and then I clicked the full text once I got there. The full text is what this document is right here. Um, usually there is there is some type of fiscal note attached that says how they've determined how much money they project this policy to cost or to bring in terms of revenue. I'm trying to find that. It does not have that here. Um, so I don't I don't know how that 13.8 million, you know, parses out to, to all the municipalities. But potentially, people could get out of jail in this process. Yeah, as long as it was a, according to the way this is written, as long as it's a nonviolent uh, drug offense, um, yes, yeah, the way that's written, absolutely. What other questions? Okay. Well, great. Great. Like I said, and if you want to hang back, we can, we have computers here, don't we? Okay. We can show you how to pull that stuff up, um, about the judges if you want. Um, we can help you with that. It's just a potential that they could get out of prison. It's not that they can go to the office. Yeah. So th this, this allows them because, you know, essentially since legally the crime they committed is no longer a crime, um, they would be able to, to petition for, for, from the parole board or, yeah, probation and parole board to be removed. Yeah, so it's not like it's not an automatic, you know, if you're convicted for a nonviolent drug offense, you're out. No, it's not that. You know, the way it's written. Well, I appreciate you guys joining, uh, joining us, and maybe we'll make this a 
every two years occurrence or we'll uh we'll do this so yeah absolutely yeah thanks for having me and like i said i'll, I'll leave that up if anyone wants to get a picture of it but those are all the links that i i shared with you and um happy to help all right thank you. see ya <laughs> thank you